Tokyo Xanadu is the newest entry in Falcom's Xanadu RPG series, first releasing in Japan in 2015 and the rest of the world in 2017. I've heard a lot of people complain that this is too much of a departure from the rest of the Xanadu series, so I decided I'll put in the last Xanadu game I played and we'll see just how different this really is. <laughs> These games never change. Hot off the release of Trails of Cold Steel 1 and 2 on the Vita, I was tipped off by a viewer about the release of another Falcom JRPG for the Vita. Of course, this piqued my interest, so I picked it up and got to it as soon as possible. And what I found was a very interesting mixed bag I'm going to have some very confusing thoughts to express upon. So many other reviewers go about reviewing this game by making comparisons to Trails of Cold Steel, and while there are very many similarities, the games play completely different in the largest areas of their gameplay. Because of this and the fact that many people watching this video may not have played Trails of Cold Steel, I will avoid making these comparisons as much as possible and have this video become completely useless to those people. Tokyo Xanadu is an action RPG. You play as Ko. Ko lives alone in Tokyo as his parents are away for a prolonged period of time. In this version of Tokyo, a great earthquake happened 10 years prior, causing many deaths and injuries. The town has rebuilt and become a thriving metropolis, but the scars of the past exist in all things. One day after school, Ko gets caught up with a girl named Hiragi. Hiragi is a member of an underground organization dedicated to closing something called the Eclipse. The Eclipse, with as many big words as possible, is a manifestation of cross-dimensional energy that spills through gateways into the real world infecting all things. The termination point of this infection is in the overtaking of the modern world by this dark energy and creating a thriving new world for the monsters that exist beyond the gate. The organization Hiragi belongs to not only aims to close these gates, but also keep them a secret from the public and prevent the Eclipse from causing large-scale disasters. Certain special individuals possess a spear energy that resonates with the power of the Eclipse and allows them to summon weapons in the presence of Eclipse energy. These weapons are known as soul devices. Only soul devices can damage the monsters in the Eclipse, and as such, those who possess soul devices are instrumental in closing the Eclipse gates. Over the course of the game, you will meet many people with resonant spear energy, and these will become your party members. The story in Tokyo Xanadu unfolds much like the arcs of an anime. Each arc involves a new mystery somehow tied to the Eclipse. It is your job to investigate the mystery, find out how it's linked to the Eclipse, and close the Eclipse gate that's causing it. While this formula never really gets old or boring, there's never a feel of anything truly overarching happening to tie them all together, and so it feels like you're just experiencing a series of hardly connected stories that just keep starting and stopping. Aside from the very last chapter, nothing ever feels like it's affecting the story or plot progression. Things simply keep happening. Again, this never got boring, but with JRPGs, the biggest draw for me is the story and how memorable it is. The story in Tokyo Xanadu is unfortunately far from memorable. It's simply a rinse and repeat of finding and closing Eclipse Gates in the only town the game has, until the one big detrimental Eclipse Gate shows itself, by then, however, it's too little too late. The final chapter gives the game a memorable ending for the most part, but everything that preceded it was simply forgettable. Fun, but forgettable. Truly, there is not much sense of gravity in this game at all, and even though the end was great, the epilogue chapter you get post-credits kind of ruins how good the main ending was. This rinse and repeat formula unfolds using two distinct sections of gameplay. The first section we'll talk about I'm going to dub the investigation section. The investigation section has you going all over town, spending time with your friends to raise your relationship levels with them, completing the optional side quests listed in your quest tab, and running from red exclamation point to red exclamation point until you arrive at an eclipse gate. Also during the investigation section, you can go to the arcade and play games like the Always Great Blade or do fishing or whack-a-mole minigames featuring cameos of characters from Trails of Cold Steel. For longtime Falcom fans, you will see a lot of references to their other IPs in this game and it never actually comes off as intrusive. In addition to these mini-games, you can go skateboarding on a numerous amount of obstacle courses. Each new chapter introduces new courses, so you can't do them all in one go. 
These are generally pretty easy, but the controls leave much to be desired. As such, I never completed these all the way through to the end. There are also optional Eclipse Gates to find and complete during the investigation section. Closing these gates will grant you one more shard to use on spending time with other characters to raise relationship levels. Raising relationship levels will unlock additional scenes in the game and grant buffs in battle when the two characters fight in a party together. Lastly, in the investigation section, do not forget to read any book or paper you can find or help people out. Doing this will raise your character's social ranks in three different categories. Report your rank increases at the dojo and you will be given some pretty darn good items to equip and raise your base stats. The other distinct section of gameplay is, of course, the battle. Battles only occur within the Eclipse Gates. The Eclipse Gates are basically just small labyrinths that take roughly 20 to 30 minutes on average to complete. This is the perfect length for a handheld experience. Each labyrinth, while only seeming to be palette swapped, actually offer quite a bit of variety in terms of platforming and traversing obstacles. There is a very limited amount of enemy types in the Eclipse, but their changing weaknesses, strengths, and buffs seem to keep them fresh enough for the 40 hours it takes to complete the game and all of its main side quests. Only three people can be brought into battle at a time. It's important to look at what enemies you'll be fighting in the Eclipse prior to selecting your party members. Take note of their elemental weaknesses and determine what party members you'll bring into battle based on this. Now, while you can bring three party members into the Eclipse, you will only ever fight solo. At the press of a button, you can switch to other party members on the fly. Using triangle, you can switch to your B party member. And using left on the D-pad, you can switch to the character who's in the support slot. Not exactly the best button mapping, but you get used to it. Characters waiting in the support slot will gradually regenerate HP over time, so it's good practice when a character is low on HP to move them into the support slot. This, however, will make the use of healing items almost unnecessary until very late game. On that note, I played this game on normal difficulty, as I tend to find normal difficulty the intended difficulty and most balanced. And while it did ramp up by the end, the battle seemed to only take longer and require more healing, but never did I see the game over screen. Using X you do light attacks, using square you use heavy ranged attacks that drain this meter here. Holding square does an even larger, more draining, unique character attack. Use circle to jump and double jump, X while jumping to attack, and square while jumping to perform a dash that greatly extends the distance you can cover while airborne. R is your run button, which annoyingly is also the roll button which means you can't run without rolling first, which means doing running jumps off small platforms can be a real pain. L to target the enemies and right stick to cycle through targets. L and R together when this meter here is charged will launch your character's largest attack. These attacks can be used in tandem with another one of your party members for maximum effect. Lastly, pressing down on the D-pad while this meter is charged will give you many buffs, health regeneration, and change your character's element to whatever the enemy is weak to for a limited time. Your character's element can be changed at any time while not in battle by swapping out this orb here in the equip screen. Additionally, using items and money known as Sepeth, you can unlock more slots to equip more orbs and buffs, as well as power up the moves you already have. Check one two. Check check. Check one two. A surprisingly deep combat system for battles that are always won versus many. The battle system was a little hard to get used to, and at the onset I thought it was a huge misstep to not have real party battles, but eventually I came to really enjoy it. Though it was a bit on the easy side and the story on the forgettable side, nothing in this game was ever really boring. The boss battles were a true highlight as they were rarely simple, beat to a bloody pulp battles. The music actually had a few pretty darn standout tracks, but most were just background filler. Like most Falcom Vita games, the graphic style is fantastic, but the anti-aliasing needed to fit it onto a handheld device is a sad thing to have to deal with. Unless you really want this game to be portable, you can hold out to get the PS4 version coming by the end of 2017. Not only will it look better and sound better, but it will also have a great deal of additional content. Sound design is suitable, but never truly stands out. Inconsistent frame rates, about on par with other Falcom releases, never really gets in the way, but you can tell when it's happening. Japanese voice acting is all fantastic, but there is no English voice acting at all, so just know this before playing. While I am thankful Axis put in the work to bring this game to North America, 
it has left me sadly missing Xseed's work. There are numerous translation errors in terms of typos and missing words, as well as oddities like fatal kill. Aren't all kills fatal? Also, at one scene I won't show you for spoiler reasons, the character text boxes extended beyond the screen, cutting off some shorter words. And this, in the back of this shop here? I'm gonna take a guess on this and say there used to be promotional art here for some Japanese products that couldn't be licensed to be shown in the North American copy of the game, and so they were stripped out and the default texture just left up. Strikes me as a bit lazy, but then again, maybe it's just a bug and it can be patched, I really have no idea. I just really don't think it's supposed to be this way. At the end of the day, Tokyo Xanadu is a fun RPG and a damn good game to have for handheld, but it's far from the first thing I would recommend on the system. A fun, yet forgettable 40 hour anime adventure. A damn decent way to waste time, but rest assured, it will be a waste of time because you won't be making any memories with this one. If you're looking for the next big engaging JRPG from Falcom, this isn't it. It's a unique blend of their other franchises like Ease and Trails of Cold Steel, and a super fun game to hack and slash your way through but until they prop it up with a better story format, some real overarching drama, and a memorable cast and plotline, it seems like it might risk falling by the wayside and join the annals of all the forgotten JRPGs that came before it. I don't regret playing this, but the areas it can be improved upon are clear as day and really took this from being a potentially fantastic game to a game that's simply just a bit better than plain old decent. It's alright, and I hate saying that because it really sounds like a cop-out. It's not really an underwhelming game, but it's certainly not an overwhelming game either. Maybe the game's just... whelming. Tokyo Xanadu is a... whelmingly alright game. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, but I gotta leave it in a weird grey area like that. I hope this has been of some use to some of you guys. And if you liked it, click that like button. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. And as always, folks... Thanks for watching.